Welcome to the Dakota Live podcast. I'm your host, Robert Morier. The goal of this podcast is to help you better know the people behind investment decisions. We introduce you to chief investment officers, manager research professionals, sales leaders, and other important players in the industry who will help you sell in between the lines and better understand the investment sales ecosystem. If you're not familiar with Dakota and their Dakota Live content, please check out dakota.com and learn more about their services. Uh, before we get started, I need to read a brief disclosure. Uh, this content is provided for informational purposes and should not be relied upon as recommendations or advice about investing in securities. All investments involve risk and may lose money. Dakota does not guarantee the accuracy of any of the information provided by the speaker who is not affiliated with Dakota. Not a solicitation, testimonial, or an endorsement by Dakota or its affiliates. Nothing herein is intended to indicate approval, support, or a recommendation of the investment advisor or its supervised persons by Dakota. Today's episode is brought to you by Dakota Marketplace. Are you tired of constantly jumping between multiple databases and channels to find the right investment opportunities? Introducing Dakota Marketplace, the comprehensive institutional and intermediary database built by fundraisers for fundraisers. With Dakota Marketplace, you'll have access to all channels and asset classes in one place, saving you time and streamlining your fundraising process. Say goodbye to the frustration of searching through multiple databases and say hello to a seamless and efficient fundraising experience. Sign up now and see the difference Dakota Marketplace can make for you. Visit dakotamarketplace.com today. Well, I am always happy to introduce my friend on the desk, Andrew O'Shea. Andrew, welcome back. Thanks. Happy to be here. Nice to see you. It's uh, beautiful outside in Philadelphia, and I'm happy that we're in the studio speaking to a really interesting and exciting guest. So, Yeah, certainly. And the, the OCIO space in general has really grown a lot. But if you think about uh, Angela's. It's one of the original OCIOs out there and they've been doing this for a long time. So excited to hear from William. Uh, me too. It's always interesting to listen to pioneers in the industry, regardless of the asset class or the channel. So we're speaking to one of those firms today. So yeah, thank you for noting that. Well, I am thrilled to introduce you and our audience to William Young of Angela's Investments. William, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Andrew. It's great to be here. Well, it's good to have you. We have a lot of questions to ask you, uh, but before we do, I want to quickly share your background with our audience. Uh, William joined Angelus Investments in 2014 and is a partner of the firm. He's responsible for conducting research in private capital and real asset strategies. Previously, William conducted manager research in public equity and fixed income, working with the Angelus Investment Committee to monitor and add to the firm's approved list of investment manager products. Prior to Angelus, William worked seven years in wealth management roles that assisted independent financial professionals with building client relationships by offering a broad range of investment solutions. For those of you unfamiliar with Angelus, Angelus is a multi-asset investment firm providing sophisticated, customized investment solutions to institutional and private wealth clients. Founded in 2001, the firm oversees approximately $6.2 billion in outsourced CIO relationships, as well as approximately $31.6 billion in consultant relationships as of the end of 2002. Angelus is an independent, 100% employee-owned firm with 77 client relationships and over 40% of those clients being with the firm for more than 10 years, a great achievement in today's industry. William received his MBA from the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California and graduated with a dual bachelor's degrees in economics and political science from the University of California, San Diego. Uh, William is a CFA charter holder as well as a member of the CFA Institute and the CFA Society of Los Angeles. William, thank you for being here and congratulations. Congratulations on all of your success. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, and excited to be you know, talking about it, about it myself, about our firm and, and what we've, uh, we've been able to accomplish so far and how we're thinking about the future. Yeah, that's well, that's interesting that you say the future because that's actually where I wanted to start. I usually start these conversations, as Andrew knows, in the past, getting to know who you are, where you went to school, where you're from. Uh, but I think what your firm has done, at least in looking at sustainability from uh, a future lens, is really interesting. So I, I just wanted to share with our audience, Angelus is a certified B Corporation, uh, which is a unique recognition in the OCIO industry in particular. So for our listeners uh, who may be less familiar with B Corporations, uh, certified B Corporations are social enterprises uh, verified by B Lab. It's a nonprofit organization based here in Philadelphia. Uh, B Lab certifies companies based on how they create value for non-shareholding stakeholders, uh, such as their employees, the local community, and the environment. So once a firm crosses a certain performance threshold uh, of these dimensions, it makes amendments to its corporate uh, charter to incorporate uh, the interest of all stakeholders into the future 
fiduciary uh, duties of directors and officers. So these steps demonstrate that a firm is following a fundamentally different governance philosophy uh, than a traditional shareholder uh, centered corporation. So very interesting that you all took that approach. I, I really appreciate that that's something that we can talk about in the beginning because we also usually talk about sustainability and DEI at the end. But why did Angelus pursue that structure? Uh, because it is very differentiated. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess uh, to start off with, I'd say that, you know, our, our mission at Angelus Investments is you know, to enhance our clients' ability to serve their constituents, their communities. Um, and we believe that you know, our success in that is really come, really comes from nurturing a culture of respect, integrity, diversity, both within our firm as well as, uh, you know, across the partnerships, uh, with our clients. Uh, and so really becoming a certified B Corp, um, it, it really reflects the organization that our co-founders, Leslie Couch, Howard Perlow, and Michael Rosen set out to build in 2001 and all of the learnings that we've, you know, incorporated, um, over our 20 years in business. Um, you know, the certification is really an acknowledgement of our values and the practices that we maintain every day. And it also sets sort of that, sort of that high standard so that, you know, uh, to which that we have, you know, to which we hold ourselves accountable to, um, going forward. Um, you know, the firm, it, it was really our, our decision internally to become a certified B Corp. Uh, but that said, you know, we really wouldn't be here without ongoing dialogues, uh, with our clients. Um, that really challenged us to constantly improve. You know, getting to this point was really a journey of learning and relearning. You know, there were, you know, I think plenty of discussion in the discourse about, you know, traditional diligence criteria, like minimum track records and minimum asset levels, um, that really ended up screening out a lot of emerging managers, uh, particularly those groups that were sort of led by persons of color. And so, um, you know, we, we had to kind of, Think about uh, things in a different way uh, to develop, you know, really intentional practices within our investment process so that we could actually build portfolios that, you know, reflect our clients' values and the kind of impact that they really wanted to, to have. And so, um, you know, really orienting our entire organization so that we could actually deliver portfolios that can, you know, do well while doing good and uh, that we can actually understand the risks that we were taking um, and ultimately have the ability to you know, measure and actually report impact back to our clients rather than just sort of say that we're providing impact. Well, I think differentiating between stakeholders and shareholders is a good start. So we appreciate that background. Thanks for sharing that information on the organization. We're going to talk more about Angelus over the the, the coming uh, conversation. But um, now that we know a little bit more about Angelus, I was hoping you could share a little bit about yourself. You, um, you had told me recently that your family had arrived uh, from China in the 1970s. You know, can you take us through your family's journey uh, to, to here in the United States, specifically to the Los Angeles area, and, and how that impacted you? you, uh, not just as a person, but as a professional? I guess I'll start off just briefly kind of on myself and then I'll, I'll dive into that. You know, I, I live in LA. Um, I have my wonderful and talented wife, Michelle, who's a director of engineering who oversees um, platform and data teams at CareRev, which is a, a VC-backed startup that offers a software-driven staffing platform that connects you know, healthcare professionals and healthcare facilities. Um, we have two young children, a four and a half year old Liam and two and a half year old Ryland. Um, I was born and raised in LA, so really never left Southern California. Um, the son of, you know, first generation immigrants from China, as you know, who, who arrived, um, in the early 1970s. Um, you know, my, my grandparents were born, I guess, during the same time as, you know, America's greatest generation, you know, the, the group that we, we really venerate here in the U.S. Um, and, you know, I could honestly spend probably a whole podcast recounting their stories. Um, of all their, you know, all, all their stories about their experiences over time, um, how much they persevered through really all kinds of adversity that I honestly will never truly understand. You know, minimal education, famines, hiding from the invading Japanese, Imperial Japanese army, surviving, uh, the Chinese Civil War, escaping the Cultural Revolution and all the devastation that was wrought from that, um, traveling 500 miles by primarily foot to escape to Hong Kong um, and then deciding in their late 40s with you know a huge family already to pick up and in their entire lives and move to the US um, and really there's is, is sort of the quintessential American story immigrant story right of arriving in the US with very little and building an enormous family here 
um, you know, so six children, um, all U.S. citizens, you know, a seventh who's a French citizen, you know, 18 grandchildren, dozens and dozens of great grandchildren. You know, they just, it, it's an inspiring story. Um, they've accomplished so much, um, through just sheer grit and determination to provide a better life for, uh, for us, for their family. Um, and it's a reminder to me that, you know, you know, talent, it comes in many flavors and it really is ubiquitous, but, um, you know, opportunities are not ubiquitous at all. And it makes me think about my role at Angelus and sort of the, the awesome responsibility I have to, to make a difference as best I can. And so that actually brings me back to the early point of, you know, how we had to relearn certain aspects of our investment process so that we could actually, you know, widen our view and make more investments with diverse owned and led managers that may not have historically fit in sort of the traditional, you know, investment box. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And thank you for sharing all of that. It's, uh, it's, it's incredibly impactful. I think particularly when you can look back, you know, to the past to help form your decisions for the future. It sounds like you've done that very successfully. So congratulations again. And, uh, it's wonderful to hear how successful your family has been as well. So we do appreciate you sharing all that. Um, so when you, when you did have to make a decision and you're coming out of high school, you're in Los Angeles, born and raised, uh, you decided to go south to University of California, San Diego. Uh, what were those years? like for you? What did you study? And, uh, you know, what were some of the takeaways? As I, I tell Andrew all the time, I'm a professor at Drexel University. I'm always wondering what students think of my lessons. I'm curious what uh, people like yourself, William, uh, took from, from your time in undergraduate. Being in San Diego was great. Getting to stay, you know, being far enough from home to have sort of been enough sort of experience real independence, but also close enough to home that I could you know, still drive home for the weekend. That was certainly a, a uh, uh, a, a, an important draw for going to UCSD. Um, you know, I certainly, um, wasn't, I, I'll say it wasn't my first, uh, you know, sort of top choice. You know, my, my top schools were Berkeley and UCLA because they had, you know, full fledged business programs, uh, for undergrads. Um, unfortunately got waitlisted at both, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but, you know, UCLA, UCSD just really had a, a, a really top notch. It had then and it remains, to, you know, one of the top you know, undergraduate economics programs um, in the country. Um, and there were enough sort of accounting and finance courses that I could take that, uh, you know, I could sort of put together my own business program. Um, you know, I, I appreciated that, uh, you know, the school didn't have a division one sort of sports teams and distractions and whatnot. You could really actually focus on, you know, being a student, being in, and there was still a really vibrant student um, life around, around campus. Um, I worked pretty much every year that I was um, at, uh, at UCSD. And so that really gave me an opportunity to, you know, get a lot of different experiences as well, meet, meet different people um, and sort of be in a service role. Uh, I think it's, it's really important that, um, that, you know, kids have, you know, students have the op that opportunity to actually work because I think if you're just studying and you're just continuing on from high school or you're really just primarily studying, um, you know, those, those life lessons of sort of being in a group setting, um, you know, having expectations, um, in order to earn a paycheck, uh, and then also realizing how much taxes come out of your paycheck, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, those are things that it's, it's good to know when you're in college before you, you get your first job out in the real world and you're all on your own. Financial literacy, it's funny, it's something we talk about a lot, at least among the staff and the faculty, is that we're teaching, um, you know, a lot of theoretical concepts around venture, private markets. But most of these kids have no idea, like how much comes out of their paycheck every other week. So that's really interesting insights. And also to very, you know, I think very common in our industry as well, you're coming out of undergraduate, you know, you want to do something in finance. And usually the first role that's available to you is something either in operations or compliance. And it sounds like that was the direction you took, William. Um, you began your career cutting your teeth in those two areas, ops, compliance, uh, with LPL Financial. So what, what was the decision you know, to, to go towards financial services? And what were those early years like for you, kind of learning the mechanics of, of the industry from, from more of an operational perspective? Yeah, you know, I, I, I always knew that I wanted to be you know, do investments, be an investor, um, but you know which direction to take. You know, investment bank, wealth management, or research, et cetera. And I didn't really know um, what specific uh, path to, to to lean into. 
um, originally, but I, I'd say there was probably a, a strong lean towards sort of wealth management. Um, you know, I, I felt like, you know, a career helping people plan and manage their financial well-being. It just sort of had a lot of personal appeal. Um, LPL Financial was local to, to San Diego. Uh, they were based in La Jolla, like literally their headquarters. Um, so I could literally, if I, you know, after I joined and I still lived in La Jolla, I could roll out of bed and get to work in five minutes. It's kind of funny. Um, and, you know, it was, it was an attractive opportunity. You know, they were, they were hiring, they were looking to hire more college students into their, into the company. Um, the firm was really growing. They were private equity backed. They were already the largest independent broker dealer, RIA. And, um, they really just had a unique story about them, right? Like in an aging industry, you know, a lot of advisors getting older, also just moving away from warehouses, wanting to truly be independent. Um, and for me, it just it gave me a really good inside look at the industry before I actually went down the path of, of becoming a potential wealth advisor myself. Um, and, you know, what I learned over that time, I kind of started in operations and I sort of learned the mechanics of how, you know, accounts moved and um, realized the complexities of advising clients, you know, and, 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 and at times... Um, how some clients can actually, unfortunately, be taken advantage of by sometimes unscrupulous people. I have recall that one of the time, one of the, one one day, um, in in the account transfer group, I processed six five thousand dollar annuities to be transferred into a single IRA. I was like, we were all trying to figure out like why does this client have five or six different annuities at five thousand dollars each, and it's because their broker was just trying to sell them products, um, and so. You know, then I moved into a compliance role and sort of overseeing that and you know, talking about you know, fiduciary responsibility and, and ensuring that our advisors did really think about, you know, what, how we, how are our practices, uh, sort of aligned to the best interests of our clients. Um, you know, ultimately I realized that like, you know, becoming a wealth advisor was probably not a good fit for me. Uh, I probably just didn't have the right temperament for it, for it. And, and that's fine. I think it was a good learning experience. Um, and really what I took away foremost was really an appreciation for the people who work in operations and compliance roles, right? It's, it's easy to like overlook them, right? That they're, they're not front and center when people think about investment groups. Um, and from an investor's seat, we're like, Hey, you know, we're the ones who make the decisions and we're the ones who are in front of our clients. But, you know, for Angelus in particular, you know, we, we view ourselves, we hold ourselves out as <clears throat> a really a full service OCIO. And operations and compliance teams are integral to, to the value that we provide our clients. You know, we are an extension of our client's staff and we are stewards of their capital in really every sense of the word. So not just, not just about the investment decisions that we make, but, you know, how we handle and safeguard their assets and their accounts. Um, you know, if we make a mistake, um, you know, as Warren Buffett said, right, it, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. And so we work really, really hard to not make um, huge mistakes with our clients. Yeah, no, that's great. It makes a lot of sense, especially the extension of the staff. Um, I, I think being that strategic partner to clients is something that we, we see, particularly out of the OCIO world more than anything. Uh, you know, you're having discretionary oversight over a large pool of capital, but there's people behind that capital. But you did mention your staff. So would you mind just, you know, for our audience's perspective, you know, giving a little bit on Angelus, um, the organization, uh, the people you work with, and, and then your role within the industry, within the uh, the organization rather. Yeah. Yeah. No. So today we're probably 50 ish employees. I'm blanking on the number. We've, we've actually grown quite a bit in the last couple of years. Um, sort of our wealth management has grown our operations, sort of everything. Um, and yeah, you know, we have, a rep- you know, five or six people on our reporting team. We have, um, you know, multiple people on our compliance and, and internal legal. Um, we have, and a couple of folks who are dedicated to trading. And so, uh, you know, we, 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 we want to be fully staffed to really support all the functions for our clients um, because many of them are sort of in the, say, 10 million to 500 million. And even at 500 million, right, maybe, you know, they, they have so many things going on with their own, with their, within their own organizations that it's important for us to, again, to serve as an extension of them, to provide them a full suite of, of, of services to, you know, manage all their money, 
not just again investments, but also all the all the processing, uh, making sure that we have our processes in place, um, and give them the reporting that they want. Um, you know, I, I'd say you know one of the reasons I was really excited about Angelus um, when I joined in 2014 was just the the size of the organization. You know, we back then we were probably less than 25 employees. Everyone wore multiple hats. I'd say we do that a little bit less today, but even then. You know, there's still a, it's still a very flat organization. We still work together on a lot of different things, supporting each other. Um, and it's a culture that really promotes from within, uh, regardless of from, regardless of where you started. And we've actually, I think one of the most impressive things we have and stories we like to talk about is, um, we've probably promoted in my time here, you know, eight, nine years, um, you know, half a dozen individuals from our performance reporting team to our investment team. And some of them have gone on to, you know, do bigger, bigger things and, you know, take better opportunities. Um, but we've also, ha- we also do still have two individuals who we promoted from those, uh, from that group and are key members of our public markets team. So we're really proud of, of, you know, growing, um, talent, giving opportunities to everyone. Um, and so for my so personally, I started actually, I also sort of had a sort of circuitous route. To public or to private equity, you know, I actually started as an associate on the public markets team covering equity, fixed income managers. Um, and about two years in, you know, the, the then head of our private equity team departed for a local family office. Um, and knowing that it would probably take, you know, six months at least to identify a new head of PE, uh, and with a just a really, really big, uh, busy sort of commitment calendar. Um, you know, Angelus came to me and said, "Hey, look, are you are you interested in joining the private markets team? It's a different skill set. Um, you're gonna have to learn pretty quickly, um, but we really need the support because um, there's just it's, there's a lot going on." And 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 I jumped at the chance, right? I mean, I think unlike the long only side where we spent a lot of time just sort of talking to managers and rehashing their performance and what's going on. We rarely made manager changes. You know, we, we really focused on, you know, long term partnerships. Uh, whereas on the private side, we were building up that platform and we were constantly underwriting new funds and managers, uh, which from my perspective really helped, def- you know, accelerate my development. I think yeah, my first year, we probably took 300, 350 manager meetings, um, with private equity and private real asset managers. Um, it was just a very, very busy time. Um, but it was it was great in terms of being able to sort of build that muscle of of of, of you know speaking with and identifying what truly made a specific manager uh, stand out, unique, interesting. Um, and today, you know, our team is you know six people um, covering private equity, real assets. Um, we also do a lot <clears throat> um, in impact investing as well. So um, yeah, you know, that's that's kind of. And our firm, my role uh, at uh, at Angelis. William, you talked a lot about the internal growth at Angelis. Could you also touch on the the types of clients you all have today and how that's grown over time? Because one of the unique things about you all is touching not just institutions but ultra high net worth individuals as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's been an interesting evolution of the firm. You know, as I think back to to what we were. When our fa- when our co-founders started the firm, um, it was a mix of sort of traditional consulting. Um, we had you know a couple of pension plans, even we had DC plans, and then we also did have some OCIO clients. Um, and I think it was intentional that over time we would really focus on new OCIO clients. Um, it's just our setup just didn't really wasn't really conducive to you know servicing pension plans and. Sort of their 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 huge long processes that they follow, um, and it's interesting because the, the wealth management group was actually born from a board member from one of our clients. You know, he he had worked at Carson Wealth Management. You know, he'd been in the financial industry for years and years and years, um, and he he loved what we did for our client, uh, which is a health which is a healthcare system here in LA, and he was like, wow, if if I could build a platform um, that could bring in money from high net worth families, many of whom are at banks and get bank products. Um, and then 
couple that with what you're doing on the investment side, you know, we could really have something here. And, you know, John Foster, who's, who's the head of that group, was really visionary from my perspective about doing this. I think it is very unique in the industry. And, you know, today we've got, I think, you know, over a billion dollars in assets on that platform. Um, those clients all get the same uh, sort of exposures to all of our managers as our institutional clients do because they all invest in the same pools of capital together. So um, I think it's a it's it's been a really really great thing to watch. You know, sort of both sides of our business grow. And then on the institutional side, again, we've continued to to build out our capabilities with endowments and foundations, nonprofits. I think today probably 70, 80 percent of our client base are endowed foundations, not profits. And it's, it's great to have um, sort of that, that'd be the, 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 the core of, 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 of our clients. William, going back to the investment process, so could you expand on the idea generation uh, process of the, um, you know, the portfolio construction as you're working with your clients uh, in between yourself and other areas of the business? So how are those decisions made from an asset class perspective? Are, are you thinking about it um, as an asset class decision or are you thinking about it as a risk decision? And, and if so, how, how are those decisions uh, effectively incorporated? Yeah, yeah. So I'd say, I guess I start with, you know, from a top down perspective, just we kind of do what I think you would expect us to do, which is, you know, we have a capital asset pricing model and we sort of price and we, ex- you know, try to draw, you know, over 10 year period what we think an asset class will return. And so we do that for every asset class. And it, we may do some sort of mid year, we do at least once a year, we may do a mid year update depending on how things change in the market. Um, and, and these are the things that sort of we put into our model. Inter asset allocation modeling for public equity fixed income, hedge funds, and, and private capital strategies. Um, I think we rarely see kind of major shifts sort of across strategies. We, we try not to be uh, to you know sort of move those around too much because I don't think it really adds that much value, quite frankly. Um, what I will say though is I, I you know certainly private capital has become a bigger part of our clients' overall portfolios. Um, to the extent that they're comfortable and they have liquidity um, uh, for it, um, so those those definitely have increased over time. And, and part of it is also just if you've seen some of our some of the writing from Michael Rosen, our CIO, um, you know, just a viewpoint that tradition, the sort of the traditional public equity fixed income allocation on its own will just it'll 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 struggle to generate uh, sufficient returns for our clients. To really meet their spending needs without really invading their corpus, so um, you know, I'd say that that's sort of the the start of, of how we look at things, just broadly speaking, from a top down perspective. Um, and then, you know, the, there there are probably periods where you know, and, and market stress or distress, where like a top down assessment does also lead us into looking at an asset class a little bit deeper. Um, so obviously today, like we're, we're doing a bit more, uh, work market mapping, the commercial real estate debt space, right? You know, debt's expensive, capital availability has declined for, uh, for real estate managers, debt maturity is coming, obviously regional banks, um, disappearing and or stepping back significantly in the last year and a half, cap rates rising. So, you know, valuations going down. And so we're thinking about, you know, how we play that space, but that's, again, that's sort of opportunistic. Um, and so, you know, I guess back to your, your original question, sort of, do we do, do things from a top-down perspective or do we think of it from a more of a risk perspective? I'd say it's, it's more risk perspective. You know, we, we are really bottom up and opportunistic within each asset class and, and kind of the risks we want to take within private equity or real, real assets or private credit, what kind of things we want to, we want to, to tackle in the portfolio. Um, we don't fill buckets at all, uh, in what we do. It's really, you know, Looking at an opportunity and saying, do we think this, um, this manager is and their strategy is unique in their space, um, that we can actually identify a repeatable competitive advantage? And that could be by sector, right? They could be sector specialists. That could be by strategy. Maybe they're opportunistic real estate and they're really good at repositioning assets. Um, and sometimes it could be about geography as well. You know, if they're really focused on Southern California or affordable housing in Texas. Um, or private equity, sort of small founder-owned businesses in the south in the southeast. You know, we we, we kind of think about all of those things um, in our idea generation process. Um, so it's it's again not not 
sort of top down. It's it's sort of just looking across the universe. And I think our structure allows for that because we're not, again, trying to do a lot of different things for a lot of different clients. We're just saying, hey, you know, we're, we're going to go out and try to seek out what we think are the most interesting opportunities for our clients. Would you mind just maybe using, I, I realize it's opportunistic, but maybe using real estate debt just as an example. So could you take us through what that exercise looks like? So you, you've, it, it, is, it sounds like it's come from you know, at least some type of top-down assessment where you're looking at where opportunities are based on obviously what's going on in, in the markets. So now you've identified, you've identified real estate debt. What's the kind of the next protocol as you kind of think through the steps that it takes to fill that allocation? Um, do you have an existing roster of managers uh, or are you, you know, as I used to joke around, are you opening the phone book and starting to look around at, uh, you know, who does uh, or who specializes in that asset class? So we'd love to hear about that. I guess you could call it that underwriting process, but really the exercise of sourcing the asset class, sourcing the managers, and then ultimately, you know, kind of deploying capital? It's a little bit of both. You know, sometimes, at least in commercial real estate debt, we're fortunate to have some existing pre- or pre-existing relationships, groups that we know that, 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 that are in the space. Um, but then as you noted, you know, we also, it's a market mapping ex- exercise because you know, we don't have a lot of exposure there. And so, as you know, open the phone book, you know, open up our, our, uh, our Rolodex and start calling on folks we know who might be in the space or just going into pitch book or whatever it might be, some kind of system database um, to, <clears throat> to just search out, you know, who, what are the groups in this space, you know, and we'll always get Brookfield and Oak Tree and whatnot, but, you know, there could be other groups in there that we hadn't met before uh, in the past. And, and then it's really take a lot of meetings, right? And, and, and it's not about, and, and try to be upfront first, like, hey, we're learning this space. Just don't expect us to move super quickly on an allocation. Just want to be upfront with that. Like we try to, you know, uh, level set with our managers about like what we're trying to get to. Um, and then, you know, identifying what are the different ways to attack a, a, a specific space. And then from our own internal assessment after taking, you know, 10, 20, 30, potentially 50 meetings of different managers, you know, identifying you know, where along the spectrum do we think makes the most sense for us to play the space. Um, and so, you know, then, you know, my colleague actually then ended up sort of putting together a presentation, bringing it forward to our investment committee and sort of talking about, you know, here's what we have found. Here's what we think we want to, here's the, here's sort of the way we think we want to attack the space. And then from there, it's, ask some more questions. It is a very iterative process. You know, I don't think we ever say like, okay, this is the way we're going to do it. And so that's the only way we're going to do it. Right? It's sort of, it's a starting point. And as we get further along in the process, speaking with certain managers that we may have identified um, and then filtering out from there, like, do we think this actually makes sense for our portfolio um, or not? So um, I, I'd say that that's kind of the way it works, you know, in terms of, just the initial sourcing and sort of the identification process. Um, and then as we, again, iterating down to identifying a measure, sometimes we just don't find a group that we like, right? And that's, and that's totally okay. I mean, I think um, that's kind of the, the, the beauty of having an, op- having an opportunistic strategy. We don't have to force anything into the portfolio. Uh, just a quick side question. I'm just curious. You mentioned databases. I'm just curious for private markets and real assets. Are, are you utilizing external databases, or is it all residing in house? Both, both. I, mean, I think we we res- we probably use more internal um, because we've 20 years in the business. We we've met a lot of groups. Um, we it's it's interesting. You know, I, I, our our founders were very intentional about we want to save all the notes that we ever take with managers. And it's it's kind of funny, you know. We we <laughs> we kind of joke when we're talking with managers because we're we're constantly clicking and cl- clicking and clacking on our on our keyboards um, in manager meetings, and we hopefully it's not distract- distracting to them. But um, you know, we memorialize every, pretty much every meeting we take. We uh, clean up those notes. We share them out to everyone on the team. Um, and it's interesting to be able to actually go back, you know, ten years ago. You know, have you know, did we have this conversation with this manager before? Have we met them before? Uh, and what do we think about them and, and how they changed over time? So it's, it's, it's sort of been a nice uh, sort of historical record of, of all of our work. But yeah, I, I'd say we spend a lot more time internally and within, within our network. But sometimes, you know, when I'm doing a market map exercise, it's good to just 
pull up an external database that we have access to to see, so again, what's out there. Because uh, they don't always, we haven't always met every group. Well, I'm curious to hear about um, both sides of the business, discretionary and non-discretionary. You know, obviously the discretionary has a component where you all can directly place capital, but how does it look on the non-discretionary side? Is it more of an approved list status and then end clients then have the ability to make their own decisions on which managers they put in the portfolio or how does that look from uh, the non-discretionary side? There are a few different flavors. You know, we have some DC plans where it's sort of a process of, hey, you know, here's, here's your existing manager lineup. Uh, we're going to do a search for a long only manager. And here's three or five different options for that. And we'll give you the, the pros and cons of each. And uh, we won't necessarily say one is like our most recommended. It's, it's really sort of a conversation of what makes sense for them, the fees and whatnot, the risk that they're taking, what they want to offer their clients. So that's, that's sort of one way we go about it. Um, it's sort of very traditional consulting model. I'd say with most of our clients today, though, um, I'd almost call it semi-discretionary because we, we don't do searches really anymore. So we actually do have a couple of clients that, um, especially on the private equity side, that go direct. Uh, they're, you know, one's a, a billion dollar foundation. Um, based in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, very, very focused as a philanthropy on social equity and social justice. Um, they actually oriented their IPS to, uh, you know, really focus on any new manager that goes into the portfolio um, has to be at least 50% owned, operated, or controlled by a person of color. Uh, so not just diversity, right? You know, it could be a woman or whatever. They, they were really laser focused on putting more manager, managers in their portfolio that were black or or latino and so you know we have that mandate and we go out and look for managers um and we don't just again say you know here's a whole bunch of groups that you could potentially go to it's it's actually here's a group we really like we've done a lot of work on them what do you think do they align with what you're looking for in terms of your ips in terms of your values and if they say yes we keep working on it we go through the full underwriting process um, and ultimately get that approved through our committee, and then they will make a commitment. So again, it's it's sort of semi-discretionary because we are still, in most instances, leading the process for them and checking in with them on, again, is this in alignment with your values? Uh, William, just looking at the private market allocations, what is it? I, I know there's no typical allocation, particularly when you're dealing uh, with clients on an individual basis. But when you think or look at your private market allocation, what does the typical mix look like? Um, you know, how are you kind of divvying up the the pool of private market capital as it relates to traditional private equity through venture capital, and then of course in, into other areas of the market as well? It definitely looks different client by client, depending on their return targets and their liquidity needs, and also just what they have existing. Sometimes we know a client, a new client that comes in already has some private equity exposure. Um, but I'd say, you know, if, for example, we had a new client with no private capital exposure um, and really limited liquidity needs, and they were comfortable with, with sort of drawdown structures and you know, locking up their capital for 10 years, um, we probably recommend to start you know, if we were, you know, yeah, we'd probably recommend, say, a 30 to 40% allocation to private markets broadly um, that we would build up to over sort of a five to eight year period. So sort of a very, you know, traditional sort of endowment model. Um, and yeah, we would build up to that level over sort of five to eight years using level annual commitments. Um, and then within that allocation, it's probably 50% sort of private equity primaries. And then the other 50%, we kind of split between, you know, one third, a third, a third between sort of private equity co-investments, uh, real estate, real assets, and private credit. So there's sort of those three buckets um, in the portfolio. There's no real, like, science to it. I think we, we, <laughs> um, we kind of just feel our way out. I mean, I, I think um, in the end, the, the, we were trying to balance sort of maximizing return with liquidity and having sort of you know a continuum of sort of money cut distributions coming back from the different asset classes right the private credit's going to typically come back the fastest co-investments kind of in between there because they get deployed faster real estate and then private equity kind of further along on the spectrum so we can build out 
a really nice portfolio overall with different return profiles, different risks. And different liquidity profiles. So, where do if they do, uh, where does where do emerging managers kind of sit in in that mix? So, um, I could ask it about early stage. Sometimes the the two are interchangeable. But if you're thinking about kind of early stage or an emerging manager who's relatively newer in their life cycle, you know, how do you approach the emerging manager le- uh, landscape relative to you know your legacy list of managers that you typically will call on? We actually take a lot of pride in the fact that we do a lot with. Emerging managers. Um, part of that is, you know, as as a firm, as a team, you know, we really like the low middle market space. Um, we just like the fact that, you know, we 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 can we can, you know, partly because we can be a more meaningful part of their capital stack, right? You know, we we probably make, you know, our check sizes are not huge, um, but we think they're right size for one getting access to smaller, you know, smaller funds. What if they're more established? And then for new funds being, again, making a meaningful commitment to them, um, that also gives us an opportunity to partner with them potentially in co-investment opportunities. So, um, there, there's a variety of different reasons why we do it. Um, and then, you know, I, I'd say I, I bucket, you know, our, our efforts in emerging mark managers in two different ways. The first, obviously being, again, the more traditional, like just regular way investors, uh, sort of, focus on market rate returns. And then we do have for our more mission aligned uh, groups, uh, clients that really want to do a lot more impact. Um, we spend a lot of time with emerging managers that are diverse led. And so, uh, you know, the, the diligence processes are, are, are a little, as I noted, a little bit different, right? You know, with, with more established managers that we put into our broader portfolios, um, into our funds, you know, we're looking at the typical things you would expect us to look at in terms of track record and execution and the team and, and alignment of interest. And we do the same thing for emerging managers on the mission alignment side. But, you know, we, I would say we put less emphasis on track record, but we don't say, well, you don't have a track record, so we won't, we won't look at you. It's more, okay, you don't have a track record. So what else can we do to gain conviction in your ability to execute this strategy? And so that just means a lot more references. Um, with groups that they've worked with, um, other VCs, their personal references, who they've actually invested with, you know, why, um, did you pick this group over another? Um, and do they, do they, do they seem like wealth put together in terms of how they would manage a, a portfolio? Um, you know, do they have good mentors also? Uh, I think well, that's one of the really good things that we've seen in, in venture capital, um, is, is our, you know, seeing, GPs at established firms really, you know, connect with and mentor uh, emerging managers and really help them along. Think about their portfolio construction, think about their models, uh, think about how to size a position um, and how to pace out their portfolio. So it's, 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 um, it's, it's sort of two different ways. We, we kind of cut it two different ways. Uh, well, one of the, uh, the things I love about the show and sitting here with Andrew, uh, besides that, is that um, we get to hear a lot of undercurrents. So maybe not what is coming up on the search you know, platform, but or even what your clients are necessarily asking for, but what you are all thinking about kind of you know, in the laboratory, what's on the horizon in terms of just the research process. So as you think about the undercurrents from an asset class perspective, what are some of the areas uh, that you're all seeing that, or at least talking about that, uh, you know, may start to, to come up into client portfolios in the next year or two. So for example, uh, we had uh, someone here yesterday, actually, it was talking about digital assets. So blockchain, cryptocurrency, cr- cryptocurrency uh, lots of talk about a crypto winter, which means it's a good time potentially for institutional investors who haven't looked at the asset class before to look at it for the first time. So I'm just curious from your perspective in your seat, what are those undercurrents that you're, you're starting to see kind of ripple a little bit? in the uh in the lab it's interesting we, you know we we try not to be too experimental with what we do uh i don't think we ever feel like we have to be first in anything um i'd say two things that we are thinking about uh right now is one you know i, I talked a little bit about commercial real estate debt but i think just commercial real estate generally speaking um particularly office you know i think there's a, there's a huge question and it remains like does office like how does what does office look like in the next ten years, um, and are there ways to actually 
you know, capture some investment value uh, in this time period. And so we're looking at some opportunistic managers that might reposition some of these assets. Uh, but we're trying to be cautious because, you know, what is the actual clearing price of, a, of an office building? Um, you know, how hard is it to actually reposition? Because we know repositioning can be very difficult. Uh, so we, we are thinking about that. Um, I'd say also, you know, in, in life science venture, you know, we, we've done a fair amount in the past, but it, it remains something that we think um, continues to have a lot of tailwinds, particularly at the early stage. Um, you know, when we think about how we wanted to attack the space, you know, there's, there's sort of two different risks you could take. You could sort of take the valuation risk, um, do a later stage, and you kind of, you, you've essentially deep, you, 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 you try to tell yourself you've deep risked the the uh, the uh, the opportunity there by doing later stage because they're already in phase two and phase three, but you're paying significantly more for them, and there's still no guarantee that you'll actually get something through to commercialization uh, and actually make money on it. So that's actually something we've shied away from uh, and really focused more on the earlier stage where um, Managers can take more ownership at the earliest stage, particularly at the company formation stage. Um, it, it, they can, you know, put less capital to work initially. So if something doesn't work out, they can actually just cut it off or they can find ways to pivot. Um, and so, yes, we're taking a different type of risk, but I feel like it, we're, we're going to get paid. It'd take longer uh, to get there, but we think we'll get paid because we'll own a bigger piece of that business at a much better valuation um, than if we had taken it um, at the earliest stages. And, and again, I, I just think there's so much going on in biotech today, uh, in genomics, different modalities for attacking different therapeutic areas. Um, pharma uh, you know, has this sort of patent wall coming as well over, sort of over the next seven, seven to 10 years, lots of patents expiring, um, key drugs going off patent. So they are armed with a lot of capital and they're going to be really acquisitive. So, you know, we, we really like the opportunity. So we're, we're spending more time there as well. Well, if you're spending more time there, then you should definitely visit Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia is uh, one of the larger homes, as you know, for life sciences. I teach a class actually in Spark Therapeutics. So we, uh, we welcome you to visit Philadelphia in the near future if, you, uh, if your manager research trips bring you here. Um, well, you, you did talk about manager meetings and you released, uh, I should say, Angelus released uh, their annual DEI report recently. And I noted that there were 23%. So 23% of your manager meetings in 2022 were with diverse managers. And, and to take it a, a step further, it, it sounds like your firm had revamped their questionnaires uh, to really kind of hone in as to you know what that means for their managers, DEI and ESG practices. So would would you mind if, you know for our audience expanding you know what that means for the firm? You've touched on it in a few areas uh, of the conversation so so, so far, but um, you know we'd love to understand holistically what that means for the organization. Thinking about that number when we saw it. Uh, I don't think we're, you know, obviously not aiming for any specific number, but we're really happy to see it nonetheless because I think it's it's validation of what we've tried to do intentionally within the firm. Um, I think actually later in that report, uh, there's actually a bar chart that shows sort of year by year what we've done. And I think in 2018, we probably up 10% of our, meeting, our meetings were with reverse managers. And to see that it's grown to 23% over the, over the last five years um, has been really great to see. Um, you know, in terms of our approach, I'd say we're, we're still iterating. I think we're still very much in the early innings of what we're trying to do. Um, and what we're trying to start out with is sort of the low-hanging fruit, right? So, um, you know, having ongoing dialogues with our managers about DEI, right? So, you know, before... You know, and before I jump into that, you know, I, I think it's, it's helpful to, to kind of get context on, on our thinking here. You know, I, I'm recalling, you know... One of my favorite posts from Michael, <laughs> um, sort of inside posts, which he titled Hot as Hell. And I think it was written like five or six years ago. Um, and first of all, it perfectly encapsulates like Michael's ability to like take a concept. Um, so in this case, like record high temperatures and really, really terrible fires in California. And then like frame it with a non investment device. Sometimes it's literary, sometimes it's historical. In this case, it was literary. You know, he talked, uh, sort of framed it with Dante's Inferno. And Milton's Paradise Lost, and then he kind of unpacked the the topic in a really really data driven way, and then tied it to an investment you know sort of implications for investors 
Um, and in that post, he talked about, you know, okay, how do we address climate change? There are two approaches, negative approach, positive approach, um, challenges with both. Um, but his perspective ultimately was, you know, climate change is, is a big, is a, is a big problem from his perspective. And you can't just step back and say, we're not going to invest in something that we don't agree with. You actually have to engage. You have to take action in order to effectuate change. And so going back to how we think about our managers, you know, we can add as many new managers as we want. But, you know, if we don't actively engage our existing managers who have far more money um, under in assets under management, then we're not doing our jobs. Right. So it's important for us to have meaningful dialogues with our managers every year, every time we have, you know, a, a touch point with them. You know, what are they doing? Uh, when it comes to hiring diverse talent, particularly to the investment team, right? I think I think sometimes what we see is a manager will say we have fifty percent women, but then ninety five percent of those women are on the operational or uh, administrative side of the business. They don't; they're not actually part of the investment team. Where at investment firm, most of the money, most of the carry is shared out. Um, and so while we don't tell our managers that our commitments are contingent on a diverse team, again, we engage them about you know. You know, how do you think about diversity? You know, um, you know, we tell them, look, you know, you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take, right? So if you don't have a broad, diverse pool of of candidates, you'll never find that potential diverse talent who could you, you could actually hire into your team. And and we also, you know, ask ask them explicitly, like, what are you doing also at your portfolio companies on your boards? Um, do do you think about and try to implement diverse um, policies? Uh, hiring policies there as well. So it's, it's, it's going to take time and we know it's going to take time, but if we never start those conversations, nothing ever changes. So, um, it's something that we're, again, as I said, still learning what to do, still iterating. Um, we, we ask our managers to, um, to provide us with DEI stats every year to fill out our, our questionnaire every year so that we could track their progress. Um, and and understand, you know, are they are they making that effort to to you know become more diverse diverse teams? Uh, that's very helpful and very interesting, William. Thanks for sharing all that. Uh, I do agree with you. Your CIO Michael Rosen has a real gift to drawing parallels between uh, investment crises and historic crises. Uh, there was one that I had read uh, where he tied the recent banking system crisis uh, to the Johnstown floods here in Pennsylvania. That breakdown in trust. Uh, you know, when a, a very small amount of people are in control of a lot of responsibility. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I do encourage our listeners to take a look at your website and his uh, and his white papers. They're, they're quite interesting. Uh, well, maybe one last investment question, um, you know, before we, we, we get ready to conclude. Um, I, I, I hate to ask about your outlook because I, I think that can get a little bit stale. So I, I've been sharing this quote that I, I should originally shared actually with um, an episode that we released uh, very recently with Shanae Edwards of NEPC. Um, where we said there are there are years that ask questions and there are years that answer. So we're halfway through the year. Where do you think the rest of, of 2023 is going to end up? Are there going to be more questions as we uh, as we close out 23, or do you think we're going to get some answers? I think we'll still see a lot of questions. I don't think we're going to get all the answers. I mean, some things will get resolved, right? Like this this silly debt ceiling fight um, that we're in right now. Uh, just going, just just this crazy brinksmanship. Um, like we could see this, the first order effects, like you know what'll happen, but like we don't actually know the magnitude of those ripple effects that might happen, sort of the second, third order effects. So we don't know how much that will reverberate. So you know we'll, we'll see if it, it ends up finally tipping us into a full blown recession. How deep that ends up being, and we don't know. Um, you know, core inflation. Is just stuck at five and a half percent, no matter what the Fed does. You know, all these all these rate hikes, and it it just has gone flat for the last four or five months. Um, so I, I think there's a huge question, like, what does the Fed do? I mean, I think they've said they're going to pause, but they also couldn't. They they also may just decide like we have to keep raising rates. Um, and it's interesting that you know, if you look at the SOFR curve, like, and, and sort of expectations of where rates will go, people really think still think for some reason that the Fed is going to you know cut rates pretty aggressively. You know, in the next year, and and I think it, at least our in-house view is that is just not going to happen. Uh, 
that the Fed is really focused on bringing inflation down. I mean, it, they have not succeeded um, so far. Um, I think I touched on sort of commercial real estate. Like, we don't know what's market clearing prices for office. We don't know what happens when, um, you know, these buildings completely empty out. You know, and and again, the ripple effects for retailers, for hotels, for you know, local businesses. So, what what does that actually mean? Um, do new banks get swept up in sort of this banking crisis? So, I think I think yeah, there's there's a lot of different questions we have to think about. Um, and and I think it it, it requires us to be patient and be prudent with kind of the bets we make in our portfolios. And I, we're not saying go to 100% cash. We would never really ever do that. But um, also don't make heroic bets in the portfolio at this point. No, that makes a lot of sense. I, I think um, it's good advice. I agree. There are a lot of questions, I think, to be answered still. Uh, but we look forward to uh, to following along as, uh, as you look to answer them uh, with your team and, and your firm. So one last question, you know, we're, as we're at the top of the hour here, um, you talked about the importance of mentors for venture capital and venture capitalists, particularly early stage venture, um, where it really is about the people. So if you think about your own career, uh, you know, how mentors have, have impacted you in your journey. And, uh, you know, if, if there are some of those people that stand out that you could share with us and what you learned. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of put them in two, or I think of, of sort of mentors in two buckets. There's kind of the, there's one group that kind of opens doors for you. Um, even if they don't necessarily interact with you every day, but they open doors for you. So, so, you know, I was fortunate enough um, when I was at Cetera Financial Group. So while taking my MBA program back here in LA, um, I was taking a leadership class and, you know, I, I sort of stuck my neck out and said, Hey, you know, I, I should interview Barnaby Grist, who was the EDP of our wealth management group at Cetera. Um, he, he has no idea who I am, but I'm reaching out and saying, Hey, I'm taking a leadership class. I'd love to interview and talk about your experience building this wealth management because it was fairly new. Um, at Cetera. And he was so gracious with his time. I think he was talking to me in his car on his way home from work in the rain. Um, and once the interview was over, he st- he actually spent another five, 10 minutes sort of asking about me and my interests. And it's funny, kind of reading between the lines, it kind of felt like he was asking me, like, what the heck are you still doing in a compliance role? Like you're an MBA student. Um, you, you're clearly, I guess I'm clearly fairly smart. Um, and so... You know, it didn't really turn into anything right away, but you know, nine months later, when a junior role opened on his product team, um, I was the first person he thought of to bring over. Like he's like, "This is the you know, it's not a permanent role. Potential, it may not potentially be a permanent role. We're kind of hiring for someone to just fill in. Um, but are you interested?" And I was like, "Yeah, absolutely." And it ultimately got me exposure to managed research, which is what led me to, to Angelus. Um, and then I guess more on the traditional sort of mentor side um i'd say you know top of mind is sort of my former colleague shauna barguti who's now the current co-cio at an la-based multifamily office um you know she she always had an open door she would always stop what she was doing and speak with me whether it was for a minute or an hour uh no matter what i had you know you know issue i had to, to come up with she always listened she always offered her opinions but she was and I'd say she was always blunt with her opinions, but she was never there to tell me like what to think, right? Like, I think that's great. Like she'll, she'll, she's very matter of fact, but she's like, I'm not going to tell you what to think. You have to figure it out for yourself. Be creative, seek out your own answers. Um, and then of course, as a good mentor does, like if I'm ever about to go off the deep end, she's there to sort of like pull me back from the precipice. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have, to have her in my life um, and to sort of help me in my career. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for opening your door to us today. This was wonderful to have this conversation. We learned a great deal about you, Angelus, uh, your approach to manager research and selection. We're, we're grateful for your time. Congratulations again on all of your accomplishments. Uh, we wish, wish you nothing but the best of luck in the future. And we look forward to hearing some of those answers as we move forward. Andrew, as always, thank you for being here. Of course. Great questions as always as well. Well, if you want to learn more about William and Angelus Investments, please visit their website at angelusinvestments.com. You can find this episode and past episodes on Spotify, Apple, Google, or your favorite podcast platform. We are also available on YouTube if you prefer to watch while you listen. Uh, If you'd like to catch up on past episodes, check out our website at decoded.com. Finally, if you like what you're seeing and hearing, please be sure to like, follow, and share these episodes. Uh, We welcome your feedback as well. William, thank you for joining us. Andrew, thank you for being here. And uh, to our audience, thank you for investing your time with us. Don't say goodbye